have Laura Clary, and she is the owner of Blossom Meadow Farm in Kutchog. And I have had the pleasure of meeting her last year, and I actually have become a Mason Bee rancher myself, and I'm obsessed. Um, so Laura Clary's work life has spanned the Department of the Interior, the Peconic Estuary Program, and the Nature Conservancy before incorporating her own farm in 2009. Blossom Meadow Farm in South Hold, New York, specializes in growing organic berries to make award-winning jam. Um, she has won awards from the Good Food Awards, International Flavor Awards, and the World Jam Festival, and raising mason bees for sale as cocoons. Um, now widely coined as regenerative agriculture, the farm embraces nature to improve soil health and is consistently harvest thousands of pounds of premium fruit each year. Um, Laura often gets lost in the thought about pollinators, which seems to make her late to everywhere she goes, which wasn't this evening, she was early. <laughs> I was the one behind today. Um, but I would like to actually um, uh, just give her a little thing because I just, I love my mason bees. So I'm hoping after this talk, everybody else will learn to love them because when mine finally became alive, I didn't want to do anything else but watch them um, and, and work got in the way. Um, so with that, I'd like to hand it over to Laura and I'm looking forward to this as much as everybody else is. Oh, thank you so much for uh, sponsoring this and putting it together. Uh, it's, it's pretty fun, you know? So uh, I'm going to, can you see my screen? I see me right now. Okay. <laughs> uh, can anybody else see it or no? No. Okay. Uh, oh, share screen. <laughs> Hold on. Share. Oh, looks like it's starting. From beginning. Nice. All right. Now, can you see it? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, so, um, Kim and I, it seems like we've been friends for longer than a year, to tell you the truth. And that's what I love about bee ranchers and being part of the agricultural community on Long Island and in the whole mid-Atlantic region. Uh, there's just something so cohesive and, um, you know, I don't know, as scientists and conservationists, a lot of times we get lost in our heads and uh, just kind of float away from the world. And so uh, activities like ranching mason bees and, and growing food uh, really tethers me and makes me remind reminds me that I'm part of a really uh, important community. So I'm really happy that we're all here tonight. I've been keeping mason bees for um, I guess about 10 years now, and I've been reading about them for 15. So um, yeah, so let's begin. So let's see. Meow meow. All right. So. Uh, like you said, uh, my company is Blossom Meadow Farm. I incorporated in 2009. Um, I uh, then, you know, kissed a lot of frogs. Uh, later on, I met my now husband who owns Coffee Pot Cellars, uh, which is a winery. So we share store space in Kuchog, but my actual farm is located in Southhold um, on the same road that Croteau uh, Winery is actually on. So my farm, uh, although it's organic uh, and it is the smallest farm in the Suffolk County Ag District, unanimously approved, uh, I am surrounded by vineyards. Uh, my farm uh, majorly focuses on growing organic berries and uh, we make, uh, we grow and harvest thousands of pounds of black raspberries, red raspberries, blueberries, strawberries, uh, collectively thousands of pounds, not just of one. And then we, we make jam from it. Uh, and what I love is that it really celebrates the labor of all these wonderful uh, little winged wonders, right? Um, yeah, I'm sure you all remember this scene when you were a kid and you're sitting in the back seat of your parents' car and you're driving somewhere and there's so much bee schmutz on the windshield that your parents went to the gas station just to clean the windshield. And while they were there, they said, eh, we might as well get gas, right? So, and I'm sure this is making my mom laugh because my mom is now watching this presentation. And for sure, this was uh, many a time in our, our blue Volvo at the time. 
So the problem though is nowadays that's not the case. We rarely have to clean our windshield and that alone shows that insect populations have declined, right? Um, so as these trends continue, there aren't as many bees and with fewer pollinators around, we really need to embrace them and maximize their efficiency. Uh, since native pollinators are not domesticated, they really need to be coaxed and managed and induced to, to nest where we want them to be, right? And uh, on Long Island, you know, a lot of uh, the areas are heavily manicured. So uh, that's another reason why bee ranching is uh, important. So I'm a conservation biologist, uh, even though my background uh, started in marine biology, but I look at creatures as to like where they live or how they live. So you have honeybees over here, and then you have pollen bees here. Within pollen bees, there are bumblebees, ground nesting bees, and cavity nesting bees. Uh, there are about 4,000 different bee species nationwide, and within New York State, about 450 different kinds. Uh, of those 450, 70% are ground nesting bees, which includes cellophane bees, uh, longhorn bees, which are so super cute. Uh, I'm sure Kim would agree. Uh, sweat bees and mining bees. Uh, and then with the cavity nesting bees, which is about 30%, or over a hundred species. You have uh, carpenter bees, yellow face bees, resin bees, wool carters, leaf cutters, and masons. Now wool cutters, leaf cutters, and masons are part of the megachylid family of bees. So we're gonna go into a little bit more detail with them. Uh, first off though, it's important to note that solitary bees are gentle creatures. Right, so uh, over here on the left of your screen, this larger bee in the palm of my hand is actually a female. And uh, to the right, you see the furry faced uh, winged wonder with long uh, antennas and that's a male. The males always have furry faces and longer antennas and they are super cute. Uh, the reason why solitary bees are so gentle is because the same female that's collecting food is the same one laying an egg. So her body is really important, right? Whereas uh, with say a honeybee uh, that lives in uh, a large hive, uh, the queen is in the hive laying up to 5,000 eggs a day. The female workers are going out collecting food and um, they are protecting that queen. So if a female worker dies, it's no big deal because the genes are still getting on in the generations, right? So. Uh, again, these solitary bees like masons, they are just the darlings. Uh, wool carter bees, like I said, these are megachylids, uh, which means in part that they live in um, like hollow plant stems, they're cavity nesters, right? And uh, I should also note that all these pictures are actually from, uh, you know, the New York region which is really important. Um, the larger picture here is a European wool carter bee. And um, just like their name assumes, uh, what they do is card uh, or scrape the fluff off like a lamb's ear leaf. And then they take that fluff back to uh, a hollow plant stem or any cavity. And then they actually swaddle their bee babies with it, with it which is it's so sweet, right? Uh, and here is a, another wool carter bee. This is actually from our farm. Uh, the flower that it's going to is called butter and eggs. Some would call that a weed, but to me, anything that's blooming is a flower and it is a food for my bee. So the cool thing about this is you see with its fuzzy underside here, which means that it's a megachylid, uh, that's one of the characteristics. Um, and that way right here is where there are scopa, which are little brushes, and that's where they carry all the pollen. So just such a, a fabulous picture. Another megachylid are the leaf cutter bees. And here's a great picture of them in um, uh, a sunflower, right? And uh, just like the leaf cutter bee, 
their name assumes, what they do is they cut circles out of the sides of leaves and then take that and put it into the hollow plant stem and swaddle their bee babies with it. So when you're looking at a, a, like a Eastern red bud in the spring and you see circles cut out of the sides of the leaves, a lot of times if you're not thinking uh, you're like too busy, right? You just think, oh, ca a caterpillar. But in fact, it uh, could likely be a leaf cutter. Here's a cool picture of three different cavity nester cavity nesting uh, bee babies. So on the top, you have the leaf cutters that we had just talked about. In the center, you have resin bees. Now they're cool because they emerge uh, as fully adult bees in the summer. So during the winter, this resin is actually uh, really strong, right? You can't break through it. So then it really protects their bee babies from predators. And then on the bottom, you have mason bees. And just like their name assumes, they use mud to plug up where they laid their baby. Although there are uh, exceptions to that, then they use chewed leaf matter instead. But for uh, Osmia lignaria and Osmia cornifrons, which are the focus of bee ranching efforts, uh, the bottom uh, tunnel holds true. So mason bees. This is a picture of a blue orchard mason bee, Osmia lignaria on canola. Um, in um, actually at my farm. Uh, to raise mason bees successfully, I thought you know that would be a, a good focus uh, for um, focusing, you know, like since I've been doing this for 10 years. All right, so to raise them successfully, uh, one of the most important things is to make sure they have food, right? So uh, this is a picture of our farm. All these yellow flowers are the canola. Um, for us, cover crops should not only just feed your soils, they should always feed your bees, right? So we plant this in the late fall, it blooms in the spring. Once it's done blooming, we till it under and then we plant two rounds of buckwheat uh, throughout the growing season. And then in the fall, we plant canola. Uh, there's also turnip in here, sometimes daikon radish. Uh, just as a side note, never plant sun hemp as uh, your cover crop um, because they say that it, it's native, I think, to India. And they say that um, it can't set seed, but in fact it can because now the giant Asian resin bee is, uh, has taken hold on Long Island and they are able to open that flower and pollinate it. So I've been telling Xerxes and all other groups that they should no longer be suggesting sun hemp as a cover crop. Instead, it should always, you know, have a mixture of canola in the fall. And like I said, during the summer buckwheat, uh, page down. All right, mason bees are great pollinators of early spring crop, flowering crops. So for farms, that would be apples, plums, peaches, a pears, apricots, cherries, strawberries, blueberries. This picture is actually a male of a male mason bee at Surrey Lane Farm in Southold, where I have a pollination contract. And this bee is pollinating an apricot. I can't believe I got this picture. I was there for two hours and wow, I mean, just so fun, right? Uh, with any pollination contract, it's important to bring your bees out when it's 5% bloom, so then they have something to feast on, right? Uh, let's see. All right, so uh, mason bees and other megachylids have perfect pollinator bodies. As you see from this mason bee that's on the left, it has so much pollen on it that it looks like a flying Cheeto. And then on the right, you have the leaf cutter bees, which again, megachylid family bees. So they also have the scopa on the bottom and carry a lot of great pollen. Side note, mason bees are great for spring. Leaf cutters, they emerge in the summer, right? So they actually finish their larval development in the early spring, and then they're an adult by, this, by the time they are ready to emerge in the summer. Whereas mason bees actually overwinter as adults, which is kind of cool. Now, oops, oh, sassafrasa. All right, so, and then you see on the bottom, you know, kind of annoying, I'm sure, bothers you guys too. Whenever people think of bees, they always think of the boring honeybee. Well, honeybees are invasive non-natives and they are horrible pollinators. 
So, you know, when you go to the grocery store and you see an apple or a pear or a pepper that's scrunched on one side, well, the reason why that uh, fruit is misshapen is because that side of the flower was not pollinated. Honeybees, like I said, are horrible pollinators because they um, fly and land on the petals of a flower and then just gingerly walk in. They are fish and pollen collectors, right? Because they collect the pollen in pollen baskets on their legs, but not pollinators because it doesn't fall off of them easily. Whereas with the megachylids, since it's on the scopa, right? It, they belly flop onto the flower, grind the pollen in, and it just falls off of them so much easier. Since we are talking about uh, successful ways to ranch mason bees, don't keep honeybees, right? And also honeybees should, honeybee hives should always be banned from protected lands, as well as any lands where the conservation uh, rights uh, are, um, you know, uh, the agricultural development rights are sold, right? So that that land is only for conservation. Uh, the reason for this is that honeybees, uh, not only are they poor pollinators, but they have found that they are so good at communication through dance that they can outstrip an area of pollen and nectar before the native bees can take advantage to the point that bumblebees that are in close proximity to honeybee hives are actually smaller in size and produce fewer bee babies. Uh, Kane and Tepidino, two really great researchers, um, did some experiments uh, with honeybee hives and they found that an apiary of 40 honeybee hives residing on wildlands in July, August, and September uh, um, they remove the food equivalent uh, that would otherwise be available for 4 million solitary bees, right? So if your population of uh, bees is declining worldwide already, and we need to embrace really great pollinators, we need to uh, help uh, as many pollinators as possible. Uh, if you could hold on a second, uh, see if we... Hey, Adam, can you put your computer on mute? I can hear it. Sorry. <laughs> I'm watching my presentation too. All right. So then, let's see some current slide. All right. All right. So um, then uh, also uh, now back to uh, what flowers are great. So dandelions are great wildflowers for mason bees. Um, dandelions are not native, they're naturalized, but uh, with all the green lawns that are around Long Island and throughout the Eastern seaboard, dandelions are pretty prevalent and um, I definitely embrace them and I think everybody should. Uh, for providing food, uh, the goal should always be that greater, greater than 40% of your yard should have wildflowers, shrubs, and flowering trees. Just having arborvitae and pine trees, meh, boring, right? Uh, those are all wind pollinated and they do absolutely nothing for your pollinator population. Uh, since mason bees are early spring po pollinators, they're great for Eastern red buds, uh, oh, fruit trees, obviously, for agriculture. Uh, also, eastern red buds, crab apples, beech plums, hollies, pussy willows. Um, on my website, blossomedo.com, there is a um, extensive list that I worked actually with Kim on uh, for uh, really great forage to plant. And this is the perfect time to really get your landscape in, um, in shape for Mason bee season. Uh, all right, so placing the bee cottages. Now that we've figured out the food uh, thing and have maximized the food by no longer keeping honeybees, and actually we don't keep honeybees at our farm, we got rid of them years ago. And uh, since the Mason bees actually pollinate so well, uh, you can actually get heavier, more well-rounded fruit and then a higher yield per acre on your farm actually too, which is pretty cool. And there's tons of research showing that. So placing the mason bee cottages, uh, here's a cottage right here as well. Um, we have them along our barn. 
I say put them three to four to five feet off the ground so then you can enjoy them. Bee ranching should be something that is fun. It shouldn't be stressful. Life is stressful enough. So mason bees see blue really well. And so actually now all of my bee cottages are blue. And um, so it used to be that the research would say orange and blue is best, but now blue is the best. Uh, and then um, typically I put white dots on the side, which then further makes it a contrast for the mason bees to see. Uh, this picture right here is actually of a female uh, bee, and you can tell that she has pollen on her underside, so uh, she's going in to um, apportion her nest with food. All right, so I looked at, I did a um, qualitative study looking at best uh, nesting um, substrates for mason bees. So on the left, you see a wooden block, which is what everybody started with about 15, 20 years ago. And then I also tried paper tubes as well as nesting reeds. Uh, the nesting reeds is actually Phragmites australis, which you guys know is invasive, uh, non-native on Long Island. It's actually illegal to cut it uh, because it is a wetland species. I buy mine in super bulk uh, from the West Coast. Um, actually, the Phragmites that grows on the East Coast, the diameter is a little too small. Um, you, if the diameter is too small for the mason bee uh, tubes, the females will only lay males in them. If the tubes are really short, they'll only lay males as well. What I find is, and what research has found, is that you want six inch tubes. That way you get the best male-female sex ratio. They lay the females in the back and then the males up front. Um, so in my uh, qualitative work, uh, I found that they like the blocks the least. Um, and this block, as you can see, is, is really filled, but that's because it was in a, a crazy area. And actually some of these are filled with potter wasps. So they're not all mason bees. You can always tell a potter wasp um, tube that's filled because wasps will sonicate the mud, kind of like uh, when somebody builds a sidewalk and they shake the concrete, how the mud comes to the top. So the mud is always smooth. You can tell when it's a mason bee because they, uh, when they put the mud on, it looks chunky. So what I found was that they like the blocks the least. Second least, they like the paper tubes and then they loved the frag tubes. Now, I think the reason for that is the frag tubes are, are have the most contrast, right? So then it's easier for the mason bee to find her home. And then she's more efficient. Uh, so here's a close up of a female uh, mason bee. So this is Osmia lignaria, pretty snazzy. And she is putting mud uh, right up here. So basically, um, the Mm, we'll talk about that in a sec. All right. Meow, meow. All right. Oh, and this is kind of interesting. Um, this is Osmia pumila, uh, which is another species of mason bee. There are actually 24 different species of Osmia or mason bee um, in New York State. And that's according to the Empire State Native Pollinator Survey that came out last year. They surveyed um, all different native pollinators from 2017 through 2020. And like I said, they found 24 different species, uh, six species of which are common uh, in New York. Uh, so Osmia pumila is a um, species of mason bee, but they are not gregarious. They won't live next door to one another. And my friend Anita Garahan, who is a mason bee rancher, was about to put her two um, extension cords together and stopped and looked down and saw that a bee was living in this cavity. Isn't that fascinating? Right? So, so um, Osmium pumila won't live in a cavity that's, um, you know, 3 16th inch uh, wide, like uh, the width of a pencil, which is what uh, blue orchard mason bees will use. Pumila will use something smaller, as you see here. So, just kind of fascinating. All right, raising mason bees. Uh, 
You know how 96% of terrestrial birds feed their babies insects because they're so high in protein, right? And how we're seeing how um, bird populations are declining worldwide uh, and the, the bird populations that are declining the most are the ones that rely on insects, right? So what I have found personally is that there is now pre more predation pressure on my mason bees than ever before. I learned this the hard way. Um, one of my mason bee uh, pollination contracts, you know, out of sight, out of mind, I thought things were going great until I went there um, and a bird had, or maybe a covey of birds, who knows, um, took out all of the tubes from all of the bee cottages and threw them on the ground and pecked through to eat all the larvae. So now I suggest to everyone that they use uh, uh, chicken wire and billow it over the top, right? Um, and then what you also do is with your reeds, you wanna make sure that you keep um, strong rubber bands around them, right? You also wanna have proper nesting materials. Mason bees, not only do they need food, they need mud. If you don't have food and you don't have mud, they're going to leave and go to a new area. Now, mason bees do enjoy going to ground the most, but I always have some buckets of mud out for them just in case. So um, since mason bees can see really blue really well, it's best to use actually um, uh, the Lowe's buckets. Uh, I used Home Depot in the beginning when it was orange and blue. I don't know if it really makes a difference, but to me, all these little intricacies will help you be a better bee rancher and it's uh, more fun to have success, right? So with the uh, bucket, what you're going to wanna do, if you can see from my picture that I'm holding up, uh, you want to take the bucket and drill a hole halfway up and then put the dirt. I'm saying dirt that's in like underneath the oak tree right? Because that has a fine fee size, right? Like the mud you used to use to make uh, mud patties as a kid, right? Mud cakes. And so when you squeeze it, it stays together. Whereas sand, you squeeze it and it falls apart. So, and you don't want dirt from your garden because it has too much organic matter in it. So you put the dirt at an angle in the bucket and then you put water. Now, the nice thing about this is that then the bucket is self-leveling because the um, uh, the water doesn't all fill up to the top. And then the mason bee gal can decide how wet she wants her mud. I mean, why should we tell her, right? I mean, let her decide. So as you can see, here's a picture on the screen showing mason bee actually using the mud. And um, we actually have this huge dirt pile and it is so fascinating because they love that dirt pile so much and they actually start digging a tunnel in it and all the mason bees go to there. Uh, so really fun to watch. I hope we never get rid of our dirt pile. I hope my husband hears that. All right, so um, then uh, putting out the cocoons. Now we practice loose cell management and uh, there's a great reason for that that we'll go to in, um, in the near future. Now, if you look here, you'll see two different size cocoons um, and the reason is because the females are always larger than the males because eggs take up more room in our bodies. Now, uh, in a female's body, I, I always anthropomorphize them thinking that I'm a mason bee. But all right, so basically uh, what you do is, uh, well, I've designed this with a carpenter. The reason why we desi designed this mason bee cottage is because it has an extended roof overhang and then, the mason bees that people buy for me come in a box like this, and then you push the box all the way in the back of the uh, mason bee cottage, right? And they're cocoons at this point. When it's two days of 50 degree or warmer temperatures, the males emerge, then two days up to two weeks later, the females emerge, and then they immediately mate. By putting the tubes facing backward, the mason bees facing backwards, and then when they actually walk on these tubes, they have more residence time. Because you know, when you go to somebody's house and you're standing in their foyer, at first you're like, you know what, I cannot live here. And then you stand there a little bit longer and you're like, you know what, if that wall was painted blue and that piece, that sofa was moved, it feels pretty good, right? So it's all about being in an area for a longer period of time to decide you're going to stay. 
Also, when people buy mason bees from me, I give them um, old tubes that were nested in the year prior. And so then they have bee smell on them. And then that way, when the female comes out, she'll smell uh, her ancestors and think, damn, this is a good place. So she's more likely to stay. Uh, so here you have a boy looking out, uh, furry face and everything. And as you can see to this picture on the right, the mason bees, they've emerged, but they're now starting to walk over to the larger cocoons. We underestimate the olfactory senses of bees, right? Uh, it's a bit forward in my opinion, how the mason bees just kind of like hug on to the females. Uh, I don't think I could deal with that much attention, but um, you know, this olfactory sense concept, um, there have been issues uh, and where uh, you'll have a, it hasn't happened to me, but um, I heard about it in the West Coast where they were pollinating cherries on an organic farm and then a conventional farm next door sprayed pesticides. The bees, what they think happened was the bees smelled the pesticides and so they left. And so the organic farm was actually not um, pollinated very well, right? So um, you really have to watch out for what you're spraying in your yard, uh, whether it's for ticks, uh, try to do it before you have your mason, if you have to spray, right? Um, because of medical issues or whatever, do, do it before you put out your mason bees. All right. So um, here is a picture of two mason bees mating. This is kind of fascinating. Um, so, and it was really interesting because these mason bees could care less that I was there. Um, this is Osmia cornifrons. Um, so the Japanese horn-faced bee, uh, they were introduced to the apple orchards in New York state and the United States uh, in the 1970s. And now they are naturalized. They're not blue, but they're still kind of cool. Uh, they live in the same size tubes as the blue orchard mason bee. And talking about bee sex, here are, uh, is a picture of blue orchard mason bees um, uh, mating. <laughs> All right, um, and then here is a uh, great graphic just showing the life cycle, right? So the bees are, emerge in March. Uh, or thereabouts, uh, March, April. I mean, things are changing so much. Uh, it used to be that people would pick up their mason bee cocoons from us, which is by reservation only, um, uh, in April, mid-April. And now with our warm weather, uh, now people pick them up at the end of March um, and then they you know, deploy them and, and then they start doing their thing. Um, mason bees only live for six weeks in the early spring. Uh, and actually, they uh, once they mate, they um, find a tunnel that's theirs. And then the female, well, the male doesn't have an affinity towards the mason bee cottage. Instead, the female decides what tunnel is hers. She cleans it out. And by cleaning it out, uh, she actually leaves some of her bee spit behind. And that's how she knows that that tunnel is hers. She then goes on average uh, for a collection trip of 31 foot, um, uh, she lays an egg. No, wait, no. She goes on average 31 times to collect pollen, uh, mixes it with nectar, puts it into the tunnel, lays a bee baby on top of it. And then she goes for eight to 12 collection trips of mud to plug it up. She sleeps in that tunnel overnight. And then the next day she does the same thing. And about 30 days later, she dies. Now, typically mason bees can lay one to two eggs a day, but um, there was a researcher that found that under optimal conditions, uh, a mason bee can lay nine bee babies in 24 hours with unlimited nesting materials and unlimited food. So that's why it's so great to have the food right there. Uh, also right next to my uh, canola, we have uh, dolgo crab apples and we have elderberries and dandelions and I'm, Oh, and of course, our raspberries and strawberries, and um, and uh, at the tail end, they'll they'll uh, pollinate blueberries as well. Uh, by the time June comes, they're pretty much done, uh, and then they spin their cocoon, and then come winter, 
uh, come the fall, that's when people then bring their mason bees to our cocoon harvest parties. We harvest them together and we'll go over that in a sec. So in mid-June, you wanna put an organza bag over your mason bees. And so whenever you take your mason bees out of the cottage, you always want to take them and have them facing upward. The reason why you wanna do that is then the baby will stay on the food and everybody will just kind of be intact. I, you know, at least this is what I find I have success with, right? Uh, so, um, and then you put it into the organza bag and then you put it back into your mason bee cottage. Then, uh, like I said, we harvest in the fall. Uh, we practice loose cell management, which, which means we crack open the tubes and uh, rinse the mason bee cocoons in a dilute bleach solution. Uh, and then uh, I keep them in my refrigerator at four degrees centigrade, 50% humidity. Um, back in the day, I used to keep them in my refrigerator crisper. Uh, you just have to make sure you don't keep apples in there because of course, when they, um, uh, when they ripen, they give off ethylene gas and then you will gas your bees. Um, so looking at this picture, you'll see that there's these brown looking uh, spots, I guess, or just little sprinkles, uh, chocolate sprinkles. That's actually frass or bee poo is another word, um, but just kind of interesting. And then you see in between the cocoons, you have the mud segments, but this is just a beautiful example of some chubby mason bee cocoons and those are females. All right, um, pests and solutions, very important in order to maximize your harvest. So pollen mites are an issue. Uh, if you see in this picture here, all this fluffy orange stuff, those are pollen mites. Uh, all bees, I've seen pollen mites on bumblebees and honeybees, and of course on mason bees. Uh, the pollen mites are transferred to bees on the flowers, right? So they fall off and then they go on to another one. So the solution to getting rid of pollen mites, like I said, is that uh, harvesting your coons in the fall and rinsing them in a dilute bleach solution. Uh, pollen mites it just slow down the bee, right? It just, uh, it's a drag. Uh, another problem or pest are the mono wasps. And they have this really strong ovipositor and they can actually lay their eggs inside the mason bee cocoon. And then their uh, larvae eat all of the pollen, you know, and, and take over uh, the, that cocoon and really get out of control. So that's why the organza bag uh, really helps out, right? And this pest has really become a pest in the last, I would say like four years. Um, it's a non-native invasive a Houdini fly. And uh, these are just basically when you open the reeds, they are sticky maggots. I mean, who likes the word maggots to begin with? But uh, what I always tell people is it's great to come to the Mason Bee Cocoon Harvest Parties because then you are harvesting your cocoons uh, away from your own habitat. And so the Houdini fly population is actually building up at our store in Kutchog instead of at your place, right? So, and then if you see Houdini flies during the season, supposedly they are slow flyers, but I disagree with that. I've tried to catch them and it hasn't been successful, but maybe you guys have quicker reflexes than me. But definitely, keeping these uh, Houdini flies at bay is very important. All right, do you guys know what this is? I see a lot of people nodding their heads because you know it's a damn earwig. I hate these things. And I also can't stand ants, right? Ants and earwigs, uh, especially in the Northeast, they damage the newly laid eggs and they also scavenge the pollen provisions. What you can do and what I'm finally going, I've been talking about it for a few years, but I'm finally gonna do it this year is putting tangle foot around the base of where I have all of my mason bee uh, boxes and at my pollination contracts, uh, I'll put it on the base of 
like the, the stands that I put them on. Uh, forgot to mention, um, with the mason bees, what they found is, uh, the reason why I put mine on the barn is mason bees can find their house easier if it's on to something even larger, right? So you can just put your mason bee on, say, a, um, um, like a, just a post, right? But if you put it instead on the side, the side of a garage, your mason bees will have a better time following, finding it. Um, and again, east side of the garage. Uh, oh, and this reminds me that this is the end of my talk and I wanted to introduce my, uh, our newest assistant that we're, uh, is coming on board on Thursday. Um, this is Anna <laughs> and she's just so super cute. She doesn't know how to be ranch yet, but I think she's just gonna have a great time. But um, I didn't wanna drone on and on because I think it's important to have questions too. But these were really, I just wanted to give you the highlights of what I found made bee ranching even more successful. But it's very important to just have fun with this and know that it's a path. And giving yourself latitude to learn um, because we shouldn't always have to feel like we have to be perfect all the time. And um, I've learned a lot through messing up. <laughs> As my husband and even my mom who's on here will tell you. So um, thank you so much for having me. And if you guys have any questions, that would be great. Well, thank you, Laura. That was fantastic. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I, I do have a question for you um, regarding climate change. So last year, you know Colette, right? Um, she does her mason bees. Um, so I couldn't make the harvest time. So Colette actually came to me and helped me um, harvest mine. Um, we, I did cover them up in organza in mid-June we were actually thinking, should we do it a little sooner because of climate change? Because when we actually harvested mine, I had all those lovely little Houdini fly maggots, and then there was also the pollen mites. I think some made it. They're all in my CRISPR right now, which is driving my husband crazy. But um, so we were just wondering, like, is that something we should do earlier as opposed to mid-June because of climate change? I'm glad you brought up climate change. Um... We, uh, Adam and I continually tear our lives apart each January and decide whether our path forward in, con in conservation makes sense. Um, and uh, Mason bee, Osmia lignaria, uh, their population is distributed all the way down to Georgia. So even mm -hmm. if we have warmer weather, warmer winters in New York, we are not creating a museum. Uh, Whereas there have been papers showing that uh, in the warmer parts of Georgia, eventually there will not be certain mason bees because, um, you know, it's just like a bear, right? A bear, you can always tell a skinny bear because it didn't sleep well, right? The, the bear needs to go into that deep torpor. So then its metabolism slows down and then it uses less of its body fat. When mason bees hibernate in, uh, that, you know, just in the wild, uh, what's happening is it gets cold and warm then cold and warm. Every time it gets warm, their metabolism speeds up and then they use more of their body fat. And then when it gets cold, it slows down, warm, cold. So um, the mason bees in a warm winter will actually be skinnier and won't have as much fitness or, or um, energy, right? Chub is energy. Um, to pollinate as many flowers and have even more reproductive success. Uh, so, and actually I found out this year, uh, now people don't use the word chubby, juicy is now the word that everybody's using. Juicy. So yes, yeah, so you're juicy, which I think is really great. But um, so Mason Bees with climate change, uh, we're, what we're doing with bee ranching still makes sense for New York and New Jersey and Connecticut um, with, uh, putting on the organza bag, it used to be that the mason bees would emerge, uh, you know, in what, when I was growing up was real spring, but now it's much earlier. So with the organza bag, you want to look to see when your mason bees stop flying, right? When you no longer see activity of them going in and out, 
that's when you put the mason bag on. But honestly, life gets busy. And, you know, I'm so used to doing it at the end of June. And I know I should do it before because there was less activity then. But you just, I don't know, stuff happens. Um, oh, my favorite thing to do is to, before breakfast in the morning, going out and you see um, the Mason Bee gals warming up with the sun and they're just looking out of their tubes, right? And then um, Adam has a uh, theater clicker, you know, in those counters. So then I count how many tubes are filled up and then you know there's between seven and 11 bee babies per tube. So you do the math and have fun doing that. And then also seeing how many mamas are just looking out at you ready to start their day. So it's really just kind of fun. It, it makes you go outside more. So I hope that helps. I know, I know I'm outside all the time with them. I'm like, I don't even want to work once they hatch. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, like, I don't want to leave this. They're just like you said, I have actually a really good video where like you said, with a, the little one, she's just looking outside and some of her friends around her have gone about her day and she's just like, no, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> you know? Totally. But they're, they're just the cutest things. Um, I mean, along with climate change, I'm sure everybody else is noticing this. My Andromeda is already done blooming. So I'm actually worried about my little cellophane bees because I have a yard full of cellophane bees. I don't, uh, you know, I have the perfect condition for them. And that's actually one of their favorite plants in all my Andromedas blooming and done. So yeah it's it's not good so i'm like i'm waiting to see you know a butterfly fly by um I wait mean, it's even just... before witch hazel it bloomed um uh, well actually technically our native witch hazel blooms in the late fall early winter and then actually the non-native ones are actually blooming now actually yeah actually over at bayard they're all blooming already so um yeah it's it's a little scary <laughs> Because that's what I was like, what are my little bees going to have? Oh, so we have some questions here. Oh, right. So let's see. So Dewang wants to know how close do you keep the mud from the hive? Or if you want to call question. it that. Good um, question. So because mason bees like mud, uh, another thing you should do is not mow right in front of your mason bee uh, cottages when you deploy uh, the, the cocoons for probably I would say like two, two or three weeks um, because the Mason bee boys, uh, they don't have an affinity towards the tubes. And so a lot of times you'll just see them sitting on the ground. Um, with the mud, I put them like catty corner to uh, the cottage, probably like three feet away. But again, this is your path forward. I mean, I'm saying what works for me, but I've learned a lot from other people because I really see this as us learning together. So, um, but I find that it just looks visually nice too when it's three feet to the <laughs> catty corner to them. <laughs> and last, last year we had such a great wet spring that I never got to do the bucket, but mine did really well. So I'm Good. just assuming that had to do with a lot of rain, <laughs> but yeah. Anybody else have any questions? Well, great. Uh, wow, that means I had a comprehensive talk, I guess. Yes. Uh, but um, I do have some Mason oh. Bee cocoons still available. I have another question. Yeah. <laughs> I have one more question. The Phragmites australis, which is illegal, which is invasive here, it's illegal to harvest it, even though it's invasive? Right. Here? It's Right, so um, Phragmites in New York State is uh, um, is a wetland species, and so even it's it, even though it's invasive, it's still providing some wetland function. I uh, like, for instance, I uh, think about it this way: like if you had lawn just going up to the water's edge, in comparison to frag, the frag Phragmites. Uh, uh, provides structural uh, diversity in comparison to um, uh, just lawn, right? And, uh, you know, so so structural diversity in any ecosystem is important. Um, also, uh, you know, it, it does filter out pollutants and stuff like that. So, uh, yes, it is illegal uh, to cut it in New York State. Um, you are allowed to cut, uh, I think, a, a pathway 
Um, but, uh, you know, definitely read those regs before you do it. Um, I, I, I just find that so interesting, you know? <laughs> oh yeah, totally. Uh, one other thing I forgot to cover is that uh, with the Mason Bee Cottages, there's 50 tubes in here, right? That's what um, they find that like 50 to 100 tubes is actually the best stocking rate. Um, and then you want two females for every three males um, because then, you, uh, then your females are well mated and you would want um, one female per two tubes. So the maximum USDA stocking rate for this would be um, uh, 25 females and 37 males, right? Uh, and, but again, it's your path forward. I just like just getting one female, you're not gonna have fun because she just could be eaten by a bird, right? Like, oh, and don't put uh, your bird, if you feed birds, don't feed them right next to your mason bees. There is this one guy, he's like, Laura, I don't know what's happening all these years. Well, he was feeding his birds right next to the mason bees and then the birds were <laughs> oh, eating no. his bees like M&Ms, you know, and even more expensive M&Ms. So yeah, definitely I tell people, stop feeding your birds or feed them on the opposite side. Uh, so then that way your bees are, uh, will be more prolific because their lives will be longer. Um, and Duong has another question. Have you, have you used the specialized storage made especially for keeping the mason bees in the fridge and do they really work? I didn't even know there was such a thing. Oh, right. So um, I, uh, what I do is I have these um, Tupperware containers and I, I sell them at the store too, where uh, there is a, like it's a plastic container that has holes on the top and then it has felt and then a piece like a Brillo pad, a, um, a fine textured Brillo pad on top to keep. So the, the mason bee cocoons are not directly on the pad itself. Uh, so they get moisture. Um, and, you know, I'm sure there are more specialized things now, but I think it's important to just try to keep things basic, right? Yeah, mine are just in like a little, it's about yay big. It's like a clamshell, but it's completely covered. And that's what mine are in, in the crisp. Oh, yeah. You know, there's one guy that- There is this one guy, he put him in the freezer and, you know, they oh. still live. He put him in there for a bit, you know, but uh, then again, it does freeze outside. So, um, you know, nature is um, stronger than we give it credit for. And so there is a lot of genetic diversity still with osmia. And so they can with, with, uh, stand a lot of um, environmental rigors, right? <laughs> yeah, so they, they really are just the cutest things ever though. <laughs> yeah. So I have They're a Mason Bee newsletter, uh, which is three um, you know, emails a year. And I also have a lot of information on my website, which hopefully will be helpful to folks. Um, and I just hope everybody has fun. Oh, but thank you. Laura, can you just say your, can you just say your um your website again? Because I'm gonna put it in the chat for them. Sure, it's blossommeadow.com. Dot com. That's the part I was. Missing. You can even Google just Blossom Meadow Farm, and it'll come up. And, uh, yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much. Wow. Thanks fantastic. so much for having me. I really appreciate it. <laughs>